everyone. Last lecture we talked about science and why it's so important and what the steps are in it. Now we're going to talk about some early examples of science and how it combated ignorance. And so today we're going to talk about biogenesis. Biogenesis is this very basic idea that living things are born from other living things. So like, obviously, you know, living things make living things, but we didn't always used to think that. There was a time where people believed that you could make life from everyday ingredients. Uh, to introduce all this to you, I'm going to show you Bill Nye the Science Guy, my childhood hero, and inspiration. A few hundred years ago, most people believed that life could just grow out of stuff that wasn't alive. Worms just seemed to appear in the wood of ships. Mushrooms seemed to grow out of dead logs. Mold grew on old bread. This idea is called spontaneous generation, mm. sudden life. It's an interesting theory. But it turns out to be wrong. Dead wrong. <laughs> See, a French scientist named Louis Pasteur showed that all life comes from other life. He boiled broth, soup, in a bottle to kill anything that might be living inside. He fitted the bottle with a long neck so that nothing from the air could fall into the soup. And sure enough, nothing grew inside. But when he took the neck off, things started to grow. Mold and bacteria, all kinds of stuff. Stuff. See, there are things in the air that are at a stage of their life cycle that's invisible to us. When they fall into soup or on a piece of fruit or on a piece of old bread, they can grow big enough for us to see. All life from life. Omne weewum a weewo, we used to say. What? <laughs> yeah, this is true for you and me and, and mold on your breath. I know what you're thinking. It'd be really funny if I, if I took a bite of this mold. <laughs> All right, so yeah, that's uh, Bill Nye the Science Guy. And I know what you're thinking. Did I film this with my toaster? Um, no, this is actually the quality of television that we had back in my day. Um, anyway, so, right, uh, Bill Nye, it wasn't joking. I mean, kind of, but people really did believe in supernatural creation of life that there was something magical in the air. They called this magic the vital force. Ooh. That there's magic in the air, and this magic, when mixed with certain ingredients, could spontaneously create life from nowhere. And then we create these books that had all of these ingredients in them. So, let's compare this the supernatural, with science. And so science is quite often in opposition to the supernatural because the supernatural does not need proof. Science does. And so inevitably, the two tend to be at odds and most predictably um, and most frequently in news and stuff like that, we see things like religion clashing with science. I want to be clear about something. Just because science usually conflicts with superstition doesn't mean it always does. It only conflicts when the superstition denies the science. Um, and so not all superstition is actually debunked through science. In fact, quite often we find proof for some superstitions. So I just want to be clear about that. But as far as this superstition goes, um, not so much. And so you can imagine there was a time, oh yeah, uh, I forgot about this slide. Um, this is what I was basically just saying. Does this mean that science and magic are always enemies? Uh, and no, not always. Sometimes um, science and superstition uh, can be united in something. Um, so, let me try to think of an example. It's hard to do. So there was this uh, superstition that people could feel the aura of other people with their hearts, right? 
It sounds so cheesy. But it turns out, science has provided evidence that that actually might be true. You see, your heart has neurons in it. And those neurons send off vibrations. Well, actually, it's not the neurons. Your heart sends off vibrations according to how you feel. Don't believe me? Put on a smartwatch. Smartwatch today, like the, uh, the, the new uh, Apple smartwatch or the Galaxy 3 or whatever, they have uh, a mood detector or a, a stress detector where they can feel <clears throat> vibrations of your heart and stuff like that. And they can pick up on that kind of thing. So your heart does give off vibrations. Makes sense, right? It beats. Turns out that other hearts actually have special receptors on them that can detect that. And so, the old superstition turns out to be true, according to science. And so sometimes, science and superstition agree. I'm not calling them enemies. But in this case, <laughs> they are. <laughs> because this is sort of what people thought, right? They thought they could have like a magic spell book. They called this alchemy and they, they would have all these recipes in it like they were some sort of summoner wizard or something and they could just make life appear. And this was like a commonly held belief. And so what kind of recipes do they have? Here's a great example. If you were to take dirty sheets and mix it with wheat and let it rest for 21 days, you would create with your magic mice. And so, uh, you know, I could see why people might think this, right? They leave laundry out, they leave some sort of food out, and mice appear. Oh my gosh, it must be magic. But you know why they really appear. You're giving them a place to live that is warm and you're giving them food. So they're going over there and they're reproducing and that's why they appear, right? So the old theory, um, a big scientific uh, person who liked this was John Baptista van Helmont. So he came up with this recipe. So this whole idea is spontaneous generation. Non-living things could be combined in a special way to create living things. Um, and so we see this word spontaneous, right? So spontaneous just means all of a sudden. So if a girl says, I like a spontaneous man, uh, that, that's a very common thing for them to say, right? What, what they mean is they prefer a guy who doesn't plan, he just does things randomly. Like, guess what my boyfriend did today? He took me to the movies and I didn't even know. We didn't even plan it. It just happened all of a sudden. And then, it, what did he do next? I'll tell you, Sarah, he took me to his grandma's and we had pudding and, yeah, I don't know. It's spontaneous is what I'm saying. It just all of a sudden, and then we went to the carnival, and then we drove our car off a bridge. Why did he do that? Because he's spontaneous. So spontaneous means all of a sudden, no warning. Spontaneous generation therefore means life coming out of nothing, essentially. Here's another example. Another recipe was if you got a jar and you put meat in it, you could just leave it there and that meat would make life in the form of flies. Sort of like you were some sort of a Yu-Gi-Oh uh, wizard thing. I watched this show, okay? I remember it. All right, so, yep. Reddy's experiment kind of disproved that. He's like, okay, I'm not into Yu-Gi-Oh. I'm not into magic. Um, let's, let's get some real science, okay? Let's set up an experiment. Let's be real, folks. So he made the hypothesis that it's not the meat that's making the flies, it's flies making the flies. So he introduced the scientific method. You see, the problem before was there was no independent variable. They just left meat out. That's not an experiment. Where's the groups? Remember, we have to have groups. We have to have an experimental group and a control group, right? There has to be one group that has the independent variable and the other one does not have the independent variable. But before, all they had was this. There's no independent variable. There's no experimental group or control group. Ready, fix that. So what he did was he had 
his experimental group right here that did not have any uh, lids on it. And then he had his control group. And the independent variable was exposure, right? So this had exposure, so it had the independent variable, and these did not have exposure. He was quite clever, actually. He made two control groups. In this control group, he added wires so that the smell could go through the, um, the mesh wire, and the bees, or sorry, flies, whatever you call them, they would smell the meat and they would land on here and they ended up actually laying their larva and so this was pretty definitive proof he did a very early example of correct experimental design and through that exposed this flawed hypothesis and proved or provided evidence for biogenesis Flies making flies. Okay, so you would think that'd be the end of it, but no. Um, after Ready, there are a lot of experiments, disproving one recipe after the other. People just kept saying, okay, so you disproved one recipe out of the book. There's still plenty of other recipes. And so one by one, they were all sort of thrown away until all they were left with was microorganisms. And so 32 years later, John Needham resulted to using microorganisms. He thought he had it. What he did was he boiled broth. Now broth is basically meat juice. You boil meat or whatever and the, the proteins from the meat end up in the water. And that's the perfect food for microorganisms. So, what he did was he boiled it first to kill anything that might be in there. That way he thought, well, there's nothing alive in here. So then he waited and living things appeared seemingly out of nowhere. And so he thought for sure, this must be it. I have proven once and for all spontaneous generation. How else could living things come out of nowhere? Um, but of course, you can probably already tell what's wrong with this. Just go ahead and tell me. Where, where did these bacteria come from? All right, so obviously the problem was he didn't seal the flask, right? So Spolanzini realized this very obvious problem, and he repeated the experiment. Only this time he introduced, you guessed it, an independent variable. He used experimental design. This is all Needham did. Where's the control group? Where's the independent variable? This isn't an experiment. It's just watching broth go bad. So Needham, or sorry, uh, Spallanzini, he did it right. He had an experimental group and a control group. You could actually inverse these if you want, doesn't really matter. So the, the, the independent variable here is exposure. So I'm just saying that this is exposed, so that is the independent variable. And this is not exposed, so this lacks the independent variable. Um, but you could easily say the cork is the independent variable, whatever, it doesn't matter. All I'm saying is there is a difference between these, and we can compare them, right? The whole purpose of having an experimental group and a control group is to compare each other. And so he did that. And when he did that, of course, there was nothing growing in the flask that had a cork. And that is because nothing could get in. Nothing could get into the, to the flask. You'd think that'd be the end of it, but Needham argued. He said, that the magic in the air is necessary for spontaneous generation. And he called this the vital force. He argued that Spolanzini's experiment excluded this, and that is why spontaneous, spon, spontaneous, spontaneous generation did not occur. And so he said, basically, this was fine, you can do that, but you can't do this, um, so you're wrong. Um, now, that's a problem, right? So basically what he is saying is, you can't prove me wrong, therefore I am right. 
no, that's not going to work. So Louis Pasteur came along with a solution. He said, I've had enough of this nonsense. Let's disprove this once and for all. So he designed a special flask. He designed a flask that would allow air in, or this so-called vital force, it would allow it in, but it was too small to allow, allow bacteria in. And so, what would happen is if the flask remained sealed, nothing would grow. However, in the experimental group, when the flask was broken, now bacteria could get in and we would see growth. This once and for all disproved spontaneous generation and we were all satisfied. So this is the swan neck flask. This is kind of the trick, right? So air can get in. And the reason air needed to get in is because uh, people like uh, Needham, that weird scientist, they were saying that there's this vital force or magic that's in the air. And he was saying it has you have to have air or spontaneous generation can occur. So the whole the whole challenge of science was to allow this air but not allow microorganisms. So Oh by the way, that actually that actually kind of makes sense because oxygen is needed by a lot of living things. So it, it does kind of make sense that if you're going to disprove spontaneous generation, you should let air in, right? So this does do that, but here's the thing. If you're bacteria, say this green thing is a bacteria, you're going to get stuck here. And if you don't get stuck here, you're going to get stuck here at these bends. This tube is designed with angles that microorganisms can't get through. And so that prevents them from getting in. And so that's it. But let me just confuse you before we sign off here. Um, I just told you a whole lecture about why spontaneous generation isn't real and everything is biogenesis. But then that begs the question, right? Where did the first living thing come from? And so obviously the first living thing had to come from non-living things. So at least once, spontaneous generation had to be true. There is a famous exper experiment by Miller and Urey. It's called the Miller-Urey experiment. Um, it was They were like college students, I think. I, I don't know if they were at Stanford. I can't remember the college. Very prestigious college. Um, and they did this experiment, and it sort of uh, became our most most well-supported hypothesis for how life first began. So take a watch of this video. Stated clearly presents, what was the Miller-Urey experiment? It was once believed that if you left food out to rot, living creatures like maggots and even rats would simply poof into existence. The idea was called spontaneous generation. A series of experiments starting in the 1600s disproved this idea, and in the 1800s, a new scientific law was proposed. Life only comes from life. It's true that rats, maggots, and even microbes are far too complex to simply poof into existence, but in 1859, English naturalist Charles Darwin put forth the theory of evolution. In it, he showed that under the right circumstances, Relatively simple creatures can gradually give rise to more complex creatures. Given this information, serious thinkers began to wonder, is it possible that simple life forms actually could come from non-living matter, not by poofing into existence, but through a natural gradual process similar to what we see in biological evolution? Darwin himself mentioned this idea when writing to a friend. But if, and oh what a big if, he wrote, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, and so on present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. In 1924, Russian biochemist Alexander Oparin published a book which he titled The Origin of Life. In it, 
he outlined his thoughts on a gradual progression from simple chemistry to living cells. He imagined the early ocean as a primordial soup, a rich collection of complex molecules produced by natural chemical reactions. In this soup, further reactions could take place, eventually producing living cells. At the time, Darwin's warm little pond and Oparin's primordial soup were really just speculation. They were founded on a good understanding of chemistry and biology, but they could not be considered legitimate scientific hypotheses because no one had found a way to test or observe them. Science, after all, is the study of observable facts and an ongoing conversation about how those facts can be best linked together. Chemical reactions like those proposed by Darwin and Oparin are not expected to leave an observable fossil record without either having fossils to examine or a time machine to travel back and observe what happened, how could scientists even begin to study the origin of life? In the 1950s, Stanley Miller, then a graduate student at the University of Chicago, came up with an idea. We could simulate early Earth conditions in the lab and then carefully watch what happens. If you can't study fish in the sea, set up an aquarium. Working with his professor, Harold Urey, Miller designed an apparatus to simulate the ancient water cycle. Together, they put in water to model the ancient ocean. It was gently boiled to mimic evaporation. Along with water vapor, for gases of the atmosphere, they chose methane, hydrogen, and ammonia. <laughs> These are simple gases which scientists at the time thought were probably abundant on the ancient Earth. They added a condenser to cool the atmosphere, allowing water molecules to form drops, and fall back into their ocean like rain. The ancient Earth would have had many sources of energy, sunlight, geothermal heat, and even thunderstorms, so they added sparks to the atmosphere to simulate lightning. The goal of the experiment was not to create life, but to simply test the first step in Oparin's model. Can simple chemistry naturally give rise to the complex molecules of life? After running the experiment for just one week, their ocean became brownish black. Careful analysis revealed that through a series of reactions, many complex molecules had been produced. Among these were amino acids, special molecules of life that we once thought could only be built inside the bodies of living creatures. <clears throat> this was a pivotal breakthrough in science, so significant in fact, that it gave rise to an entirely new field of research now known as prebiotic chemistry. Scientists don't know for sure if the gases used by Miller really were the most common gases of the ancient right, we're, Earth. We're good, you get the idea. So these amino acids were created through this combination of chemistry. So then what is an amino acid? Well, it makes up meat, mostly, like a protein. So when you eat a cow, for example, that cow gets broken down. Now you know that you chew your food and then that chewed food, it goes to your stomach, your stomach acid breaks it down and then you break it down even more into your gut. Do you ever wonder what you're breaking it down into? You're breaking it down first into protein because cells are made of protein. The, the cow that you ate, you ate its cells. Those cells get broken down into protein. That's why they say that meat has so much protein. And then that protein is broken down into its parts, which are called amino acids. That allows us to then rebuild, to take those amino acids and rebuild them into human protein and then into human cells. And so we are not part cow. We, we don't eat a cow and become part cow. We eat a cow, break it down, and then rebuild those amino acids to make you, right? So we found those amino acids when they did this experiment, which is a necessary step for life, right? You're made of them after all. So kind of interesting. I don't know. Um, anyway, that's pretty much it today. Hope you liked it and I'll see ya.